Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. Not only are gardeners growing more food these days, they're back into the herbs that flavor them. Today, Amanda Moon from It's About Time shows what's hot on this spring's herbal radar. On tour, we head to Elmont, where Kathy Hale built a garden one idea at a time. When Kathy Hale gets a break from her beauty shop, she takes a walk in her garden. As for her customers, a stroll on their own comes at no extra charge. It's not far to the garden. When Kathy and her husband Bill bought eight acres in Elmont 26 years ago, they knew there was plenty of room for their home and businesses, plus rich, fertile soil. My mother-in-law told me that when, when this was planted in cotton and then, then they picked the cotton and left the burrs and they would till it in every year. And when we first moved here and started keeping a yard, the, the Bermuda grass is just native and it just took over. And uh, it was always beautiful, hardly watered it. And uh, she said it was because that the burrs, you know, cotton burrs, compost is really good. Kathy's plants thrive too when she dug out grass to frame spaces with gardens. Since it was such a wide open space, I wanted to close it in a little bit, make it because of the fields, you know, you can't possibly make everything look nice. So I just started putting little walls up, fences, and making it a small backyard. One spot is a shady arena defined by the structure she built, along with plants and sun and shade. It's invitation, come slow down with me and just relax. Yeah, it seems like if somebody's out here, then somebody will stop and say hi and then they'll sit. For a shortcut to the outdoor kitchen they built and the pool beyond, Kathy built a path. Then she decided that the perfect connection between these two intimate areas was a waterfall and a creek. From the pool, the outlook back to the house is broad and sunny. Kathy gave it more formality. Even in the lawn that connects to the house, she planned destinations and viewpoints for whatever the family is up to. Yeah, a, a different location for different functions, you know. This is really casual if you're barbecuing, you know, just like the patio over there is more formal, I, I'd say, you know, and this is, you know, everybody just kind of sits around and you don't have to worry about, you know, barbecuing just on that pit there and, and we've got the one at the pool. It's all different. The new patio next to the house started when a first tree they planted grew up. We had uh, no patio back there. It was just all grass all the way to the house. And when the tree got big enough to shade, I couldn't grow Bermuda and didn't want the St. Augustine because of the watering. So instead we just put the patio and, and now that's great. That is the place to be. <laughs> Kathy's made it easy for everyone to travel to the spot that suits their mood while keeping them and the gardens all connected. Although she likes curves to soften structure, straight lines work best for her first project, the vegetable garden. I think people are getting back into the gardens. A lot of people that I'm talking to now with grocery prices, the little garden, the little backyard garden, and keep it small. I don't ever till mine, I do everything by hand, which is good exercise, but a lot of people get overwhelmed with the big garden and have to till, and then it's, it gets hard, you know, rocky, and with our dry summers, if they keep it small, they can just put some drip hoses, and it really does pay off. Have you seen the price of watermelons lately? <laughs> One watermelon's like $6. Straight lines also give this nook its distinction, with paper she stained and tempered with Mondo grass. I couldn't cut grass in there anymore, so I was weed eating and it still made a mess and it was a useless space. So I decided to make it easier, keep the weeds down just to put the patio. When Kathy finds a spot that needs creative attention, hard work doesn't discourage her. The little columns there, I learned how to brick and I bricked those. I 
like to work with rock, <laughs> as you can tell. I don't know why, it's just, I don't know, it's relaxing. Some of her projects were not on her schedule. I'll tell you what happened right there, that, that red tip photinia died over about three years. We've been cutting it back and that was all shade. You know that cast iron plant like shade and that oak leaf hydrangea like shade. And then I've got that big fern in there and now it's got sun. <laughs> so luckily this mulberry tree has given it a little bit of shade, but boy, things change. I, and what was sun, full sun over there, this tree was little at one time and all that has now gotten shaded and I'm having to change. Oh, it changes all the time. But nothing gets babied except for mulch to hold in precious water. If they do good the first year and I don't lose it and, and eventually multiply it, but if something that I buy doesn't make it, I don't try it again. And I get my mulch, I buy some for, for this part of the yard, but the big areas, I ask the guys that trim trees, they're usually willing to just have a place to dump it. I have a big pile back there that I keep, and that's what I'll mulch the garden with now that everything's up and I can see where my rows are. Since she wants the wildlife to stroll the garden too, Kathy avoids anything that could harm them. So when grasshoppers invaded a few years ago, she got chickens. Chicks get a video visit outside before they return indoors until big enough to join the flock. Then I went to ducks because of the snail problem I have. They love snails and they don't make a mess. They're, they don't scratch. They just kind of walk around and put their noses in, in the shrubs and eat bugs. That's just what Kathy, Bill, and their two sons wanted, a garden to walk around in, poke into, and live in. If people like their house, their indoors, the outside is, you know, it's just another place to be. Everybody stays in the house and watches TV. You know, we're outside, we are outdoors a lot, even in the wintertime. My garden friends and my customers, they, they know they can come and look around anytime they want to and get ideas. I had people stop the other day just wanting to look. It's very relaxing when it's all done. You look back and you see it and it's like, okay, I feel like I'm in a park <laughs> in a way. All right, thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. And right now we're gonna be talking about one of the hottest topics in gardening. Uh, herbs for your edible garden and I'm joined by Amanda Moon from It's About Time here in Austin and uh, It's About Time a great place that really is rooted in the herb business and Absolutely. but has grown into a full service landscape center. Yeah herbs are uh, they're actually where she got her start mm -hmm. um, 18, 19, 20 years ago, um, her main focus was culinary herbs and antique roses. All right. When you say her, you're talking about the owner. The owner. There. All right. Yeah, yeah. Diane Winslow. And uh, it is a respected nursery. And uh, right now, I know the doors are being busted down by people who are interested in uh, growing these plants. There definitely has become a trend this year towards growing uh, edible plants in your landscape mm -hmm. as opposed to just putting in color or shrubbery right. and just being able to combine all the different textures and colors and tastes right. into even smaller yards. Yeah, well, and you can do that. I mean, um, just because they are edible doesn't mean they're not ornamental. Absolutely. And there are so many of these plants that have gorgeous foliage and as you indicated, just the textures alone mm -hmm. on a lot of these different things uh, warrant them being in the garden, even if they weren't edible. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's take a look at some of these different things because there's so many different varieties of, of plant out there now. Um, people may not be aware of some of their options. Now, we're going to start with the mint family, and there are lots of different mints out there. When I think of mint, I think of this invader species, which uh, you, you've brought it one. It can be, <laughs> yes. Okay, the, 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 this one here in the foreground is a monster. That's just the old spearmint. That's the standard spearmint. You know, mm -hmm. people are sort of referring to it as a mojito mint style uh, now. Uh, that's, <laughs> it's becoming, I, uh, becoming gotcha. quite a little popular mint. Uh, right. But there's some great other options. Uh, mm -hmm. Pineapple mint mm -hmm. is one of them. 
wonderful variegation, beautiful in the landscape, not quite as invasive as spearmint, uh, but makes a wonderful sun tea. Okay, and, and what, what and are we that is the pineapple this mint. This is the pineapple mint right here. I uh, see the variegation. I didn't even notice it when I pick it up. Just a little hint of variegation. That one's just got a little bit, and then as it grows mm -hmm. and as it expands, it's going to produce more and more shoots that have okay. more of that variegation. I have to, I have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little hint of that pineapple going on there. And just That's take a few slices of oranges uh -huh. and put it in some sun tea with a big handful of the pineapple mint, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic on a hot summer day. I think it would be good in mojito, too. Uh, <laughs> probably so. <laughs> so the pineapple mint in addition to the spearmint, and then there's yet another variety that mm -hmm. you brought in this one. I love the trailing thing on this, but that looks... A little invasive to well, me as well. Well, it is. Uh, that actually goes by two names. It goes by black stem peppermint or mm -hmm. chocolate mint. Ah, a lot of people know mm -hmm. it as. It has, you know, it's a wonderful mint to use in sweets and to mm -hmm. use in hot teas. Uh, okay. A very cooling effect okay. so when you have a cough. Right. Uh, mints, the best thing to do is to put them in a large container. If you want to plant them in the ground, cut the bottom out of it. Semi-sink mm. it, and that will help keep some of that lateral growth uh, from invading the rest right. of your plants. You can always trim around the container. Exactly. 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 Well, very attractive, too, though. I really like the dark, dark st uh, stolen-like growth on these. It's very cool. But it will root along every one of those stems. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will. Now, uh, scented geraniums, I, l I have to say I love the geraniums uh, generally, mm -hmm. but the scented ones are, are especially cool. And you've brought a number of different ones here, and these are uh, really aromatic. They're extremely aromatic. Um, mm -hmm. So they're both an aromatic herb, but they're also a culinary herb. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use them as a base for pound cakes, and they can be used as garnishes and in teas. And mm -hmm. the nice thing is they're more shade tolerant um, than a lot of the other herbs. Right. And uh, this one is a variegated uh, rose mm -hmm. lemon. But the other options that you can do, one of them is citronella. One of the things we see is a mosquito repellent. Mm. That's actually a rose lemon scented geranium. Huh. And the best way to use that is to take the leaves, crush them up, wipe them on your arms. And it is useful for not only mosquitoes, but biting flies. Very interesting. Well, love them, and there are lots of different forms. I think we'll keep moving in terms of the different varieties of things that are available out there. But uh, don't forget the scented geraniums. Now, uh, we have lots of different options in terms of oreganos mm -hmm. as well. And the oreganos are important because they're both deer resistant and evergreen. Okay. So they're fantastic in a landscape. The, uh, one of them is Italian oregano. That's going to be your standard pizza oregano. Mm -hmm. Another option that you can do is Greek oregano. Okay, now which is this one? Then? That's the Greek oregano. Okay. And that's going to be a lower growing, mm -hmm. and it's going to be evergreen, and it's going to have more of a peppery flavor okay. than your standard oregano. Okay. So when you want a little bit of a bite, that's what you would use. Okay, so this is the Greek oregano, and I, I like the dark green mm -hmm. color on this, and it looks like it would make a fantastic ground cover. It does, absolutely, for sun uh, mm -hmm. or part shade even. Okay, and and this is the Italian, I take it? It or? is, and mm -hmm. that's going to be more of a 18 inches by a 2 foot. Right. Sometimes a little bigger. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> a lot bigger. Yeah, yeah. Very, very sturdy, <laughs> sturdy uh, little landscape plant. Hey, yeah, I, I planted some in a dry garden in mm -hmm. my last garden, um, and it engulfed some red yucca and a few <laughs> other things, but uh, it, it, it is one of those dependable performers. It is, it is, yeah. and you know, just trim it back every couple mm -hmm. of years, and it was evergreen even this year. Yeah, it, you know, I, I took a heavy hand to it about once or twice, mm -hmm. and that seemed to do the trick, so, <laughs> and you know, people should be aware that these are, for the most part, these are pretty tough plants. They that, really they are. They really will keep going. Now, uh, the thymes are really, really popular. It's one of my favorite herbs to use in my kitchen. And uh, which one are we looking at here? This one has a hint of variegation in it, it as does, well. It does, and it's referred to silver thyme mm -hmm. uh, because of that variegation. Uh, but it's a form of English thyme, and so you can use it for any standard culinary purposes, but it makes a beautiful, low-growing, spreading mm -hmm. accent in your garden. Full sun to part shade, mm -hmm. and you know there, the other times there's a, a variegated lemon thyme right. that's going to grow very similar. Um, the French thyme is going to be more upright, so if you don't have a lot of room for a spreading herb, but you mm -hmm. need something kind of basic, French thyme would be the one to do. Well, and uh, you know I love the compact form of the thymes, and I know that many gardeners will actually use them like in stepping stone pathways mm -hmm. and things like that between the stones. 
because they're, they have such a tidy and, and low-growing mounding habit that they're perfect for that condition. And occasionally, if you do step on it a little bit, you release that fragrance into the garden, too. And elfin thyme and caraway thyme are two perfect options to do between stepping stones. Okay, so keep all those things in mind. <laughs> Lots of cool things there in, too many in terms choices. of thymes. Yeah. Now, this, this really surprised me, because we were talking before we got rolling here, and you're talking about the, the chards. And being good, I, I always think of these leafy crops mm -hmm. as being winter crops. Absolutely. But, but you said this is a great one for the uh, summer. Oh my goodness, Swiss chard is probably one of the most heat tolerant salad greens that we can grow. Great. I've got mine, this particular one is Bright Lights Swiss chard. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are other varieties that have white or red stems. Mm -hmm. And this stuff you can put in full blistering sun but it's also shade tolerant and it can take 112 degrees and still be harvestable, but it can also take the extremes in the cold uh, winters mm -hmm. and still be usable. Well, I, I love chard. I really, really Wonderful love it. Wonderful in stir fries and quiches. Right? Yeah, Do you, sh and, you know, I've, I have friends who have some recipes where they use the leaves to kind of wrap things and mm -hmm. bake them like a lasagna. Or, oh, or, absolutely. You, know, you can like use that. it similar to spinach. Sp ex exactly. Anyway, wonderful stuff. Now, this one I really wanted to work in because I'll just, I love the foliage on this. This is Salad Burnett, mm -hmm. and I know nothing about growing this. Well, Salad Burnett, the cool thing about it is its new growth tastes like cucumbers. Mm -hmm. So you can chop up the leaves and dress your salad with it. Okay. But it's extremely heat tolerant, makes a little mound mm -hmm. in the in the herb bed or yeah. in the landscape even, and is actually evergreen. Love the foliage on this. I love the way it, you know, it, it just aligns along the stems mm -hmm. like that. You know, a little starburst kind of uh, quality. And, in it, terms of and it continues to grow like that as okay. well. Okay. Really, really cool. So Salad Burnett. This would also work in some drinks, I'm thinking, like Bloody Marys or something. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Certainly we would work with tomato-based drinks. Right, right. Well, there's so many different options. I th you know, it's hard to just pick any last thing to finish on. But real briefly, we got to mention the sages because mm -hmm. I, I really love this plant. Absolutely. Sage is a wonderful Mediterranean herb. Mm -hmm. It's extremely drought tolerant, deer resistant. Yeah. This particular one is tricolor sage. They're going to stay relatively small, so if you don't have a lot of space, like a square foot garden, they're perfect to use. Okay. Well, Amanda, it's been such a pleasure visiting with you, and I can understand why folks are beating down the doors to get to all these really cool plants to include mm -hmm. in their garden. So, uh, again, it's about time, mm -hmm. located in the southwest part of Austin. It's great to have you joining us this uh, today for the program, and people can find you online, I'm sure. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's about time. And thanks so much. Coming up next, uh, we're going to be hearing from our friend Daphne Richards. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week is from our, one of our viewers, Liz. And she has a young Possum Hall holly that didn't produce any berries last year and lost all its leaves over the winter. Well, there's some very good news. Possum Hall hollies are deciduous, so it did naturally lose its leaves, and that's not a bad thing. That was a natural phenomenon. It may have been slow to put on its new leaves this year because of our cold winter that we had. And its lack of berries is most likely because it's young. But Possum Hall is a dioecious plant, meaning that there are male and female plants separate. So Liz also asks, does she need a male plant to pollinate her female plant? Well, yes and no. Of course, a male plant would be required to pollinate your female plant and have berries, but there's most likely enough male plants out in your neighborhood and even farther beyond to pollinate your plant. So you don't need to plant a male plant especially. You do need to give this plant some time and you will have berries for all the birds in the neighborhood. Our plant this week is Mexican Evening Primrose, Inothera speciosa. This is one of our beautiful native wildflowers that has delicate pink flowers and they start out kind of white and then they turn to pink. It's a perennial, which means it dies back to the ground in winter. It's normally only about 8 to 12 inches tall and 15 inches wide in the landscape, but it does get much wider if given plenty of space. It spreads easily, so it makes a great ground cover, especially for large natural areas. As its name suggests, the flowers open in the evening. And again, they start out mostly white, turning pink as they age. 
They also have a soft, yellow, powdery, pollen-covered center because of their pistils, giving them another common name, buttercups. They're easily established from seed and planted in late summer or early fall, as are most of our wildflowers. It's very happy in the hottest, least cared for part of your landscape. It does great in rocky, shallow soils with no supplemental irrigation. So don't water these plants too much once you establish them. They don't respond well to that and can have root rot. It also does well in natural, meadowy plantings with other wildflowers. And it's best planted in full sun and well-drained soil. It does spread underground during the winter, and so it pops up all over the place the following spring in your yard. To do this week in your garden, it's time to begin regular lawn maintenance. You may have already had to mow several times, and now you should begin mowing regularly. But don't scalp it. Mow regularly, three to four, five days, depending on how fast it's growing. You don't need to let it grow too tall and then scalp it back. That's not good for it. If it is completely green at this point, you may go ahead and fertilize it if you wish, or you can wait and fertilize it once in the fall. There's no need to over fertilize your grass. It encourages faster growth, so you'll have to mow more and water, water more. Do watch the rainfall patterns. It is time to start irrigating, but don't over water or water too sporadically. You do need to water at least an inch a week if you are watering your grass to keep it healthy, but don't over water it because grasses really don't take as much water as we give them. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Tricia Shirey for Backyard Basics. Gourds have been used for centuries for birdhouses, musical instruments, dippers, containers, bowls, and just for decorative purposes. There are many shapes and sizes, from apple gourds to birdhouse gourds, bowl gourds, and the loofah sponge type gourd. They're very easy to grow. Now you can find seeds at your local nursery or garden center, and you'll plant four or five seeds per spot in a very well uh, prepared soil, lots of organic matter. Thin them to two plants, uh, the healthiest plants, and provide them strong support. If they're hanging, they tend to get better shapes. They'll form a thick canopy of vines for shade all summer long, and some can grow up to 20 feet or more. Generally, you'll harvest between 10 and 20 gourds per vine, with the largest gourds coming from the very first pollinated of the flowers. They have very few insect problems, occasional aphids, maybe cucumber beetles or stink bugs. Vine borers sometimes bother them. Loofahs seldom have any bug problems at all. They, they do appreciate regular compost and or occasional organic fertilizer for best yields and to keep the vines very healthy. Now, they, most of them will have about 100 to 110 days to harvest, so plant them early. The vines will start to lose their leaves and the stems turn brown and that's when it's time to harvest the gourds. And the gourds should be very firm to touch. If you harvest too soon, the gourds will rot. Now for drying, it may take four or five months. They can be dried outside. In fact, you don't really wanna dry them indoors because they're quite smelly. It's okay if they're out in the elements, but it's better if they're in some shade. And uh, turn them every couple of weeks to make sure that they dry evenly. You'll hear the seeds rattle when they're good and dry. And uh, they do cross pollinate freely, so the seed might not be true to type. Now with uh, the gourds, you may wanna do some cleaning of them. I like to just display baskets of gourds in their natural condition. Uh, they'll have this wonderful modeling of mold on them. But if you wanna clean them off, you can uh, spray, paint th spray them really well. Um, I sometimes take them to a car wash to really blast the mold off. You can also soak them and then scrub them with a metal pot brush, or you can sand the uh, mold off of the gourds, but make sure you you wear a, a very good mask because the uh, the s membranes inside and the um, the outside covering can be very harmful to your lungs. And uh, the gourd seeds will not always be true to type. They do cross pollinate quite 
uh, quick, well, quite readily, so you might not get the same gourds if you plant the seeds, but you might want to try it. Uh, now, you can finish them in many different ways. You can use shoe polish for a beautiful finish on the gourds. You can also use a variety of wood stains from uh, the uh, solid body wood stains for bright colors to just any kind of wood, actual wood stain. And if you're going to use the, the gourds outside for birdhouses, make sure you're using a non-toxic type wood stain and let it dry very well. You can also use latex or acrylic paints pens, wood burning uh, tools, and you can cut the gourds open and make containers with them, bowls. Uh, there's just no end to the ways you can use gourds. And uh, they're just a lot of fun and they last for years and years and years. So if, as long as they dry really well, you'll have gourds to decorate with uh, for years to come. For Backyard Basics, I'm Trisha Shari. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and read our blog. Next week, we explore the perils and pleasures of zone pushing. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.